I would like to start with my talk at Dad's memorial service just to reflect on how important this um, going into the Peace Corps was to my dad and how it started a new phase of his life. It starts with in 1965 when the Lauders were four young boys and two adventurous parents. Adventurous parents, we took off in a Willie's Jeep from our home in Malawi for a safari up through East Africa. The Cape to Cairo road back then was an all dirt patchwork with a lot of mud during the rainy season, all the more attractive to Will and Jane. <laughs> Mom and Dad took us to Old Divide Gorge where Lewis and Mary Leakey had uncovered the first bones of early human ancestors. It wasn't until I returned in my own migration to that region to live and marry that I realized that that trip to Old Divide Gorge was the symbolic closing of a loop, a 300,000 year journey of hundreds and even thousands of migrations that started when Homo sapiens, our ancestors, spread around all of Africa and out of Africa to the Middle East, Asia, and Europe. Many hundreds of migrations brought Dad's ancestors to Northern Europe. Then starting in the late 1600s and into the 1870s, the big leap across the Atlantic. From there westwards, a dozen smaller migrations with settled sojourns in Boston, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Chicago, Missouri, Texas, and finally Oregon and Oakland, California. I like to entertain the idea that over those hundreds of migrations and thousands of generations, Dad's ancestors must have been subject to selective forces, if you will, for genes that drove the taking of risks, for exploring new territory. In 1871, Dad's mother's family, the Vernons, who with nine boys and a sister, Aunt Grace, homesteaded a ranch in Oregon. Dad's father's family, the Lauders, emigrated from Germany at that time. I wonder what kind of personality, what kind of genetic makeup it takes to pick up and forever leave a homeland. In the Lauder case, a history of the Baker's skill in Bavaria. Migration. The heartache that those ancestral one-way migrations engendered and the strength that it took to persevere can perhaps best be felt in a song that can be Googled entitled, From Claire to Here. It's a long, long way from Claire to here. So in 1964, with those genes, if you will, that deep yearning to explore new territories strong in their hearts, and with the social winds of the 1960s blowing over their shoulders, and with no more west to go, no more geographical west to go from California, where do you go? Well, of course, you embrace a brand new concept called the Peace Corps. You join, you pack up your four young boys, and you go to Africa. The two and a half years in Malawi opened up new territory for mom and dad social territory. And that need to reach out and explore was satisfied by connecting with people of other cultures. Peoples on the margins of our dominant and well-off society, people of totally different culture and language, who had become vulnerable, who had experienced suffering. This, I believe, became my dad's way of, our dad's way, of satisfying that deep need in his soul to experience and explore the new. My dad wasn't a religious person. He early on rejected the fire and brimstone Southern Baptist religion that his mother had inherited from the Missouri era of the Vernon family. 
before they came west. He didn't consider himself Christian in the contemporary religious sense. However, Dad's development of a deep and often risk-prone commitment to the vulnerable of humanity, to the left behind, to, in, in, to those who in times past would have been considered outside of society, unworthy of consideration, was, I believe, what Jesus would sanction for Christians to do. Dad inherited this central part of the Christian religion from both sides of his family, that of love and its social context, while at the same time rejecting the more structured aspects of religion. He never analyzed this. He just did in the fall of 1964, I started seventh grade at Davis Junior High School down Russell Boulevard, which was the old high school and is now the city hall complex. But I would go to the library, the, uh, the school library, reading is such a great way to um, have your mind, to, to cultivate your mind because you you actually, you're given a framework, but you have to create the picture, okay? Which is so much better than sitting back and, you know, watching TV and movies, which I enjoy, um, but you don't have that co-creating process. That process that resonates with the dozens of millennia that our ancestors experienced sitting around a fire at night, especially in the northern climes where in winters it was dark at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 p.m. And the storytelling was so important, the oral tradition. And so in either hearing or reading these words, we create the picture. And that is so important. And I touch on that in my video chapter on my six years in Tanzania, because most of the African culture has become so attached to their televisions. Every government in every country in Africa broadcasts television to nearly every part of its country and people then watch the movies they also have the ability to play DVD movies which are sold in the streets and so I found that very few youngsters read or are read to so I hope to talk about that and African culture because I believe that has important ramifications for Africa's future so in the fall of 1964, after three months of seventh grade at the Davis Junior High School, Dad had joined the Peace Corps, and we packed up. We had Thanksgiving with Grandma and Grandpa Baker, rented out the house along with Sparky the dog, and got on a PWA flight to Washington, D.C., where we would stay for six weeks. And we got all our shots at Travis Air Force Base. Mom bought us warm clothes at Penny's in Woodland to wear in Washington, D.C. during the entire month of December and half of January. And so we took our first flight on an airline, and we were thrilled because the stewardesses brought these trays of food with little packets of three cigarettes. We, we loved that. Mom was quite chagrined by that. How could they put those cigarettes on the uh, trays of the children? And uh, we liked that. And so we uh, got to Washington, D.C. in midwinter, rented a house in Arlington, Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C. Mom has stories about that house because we uh, lived on the middle floor and the stairs that went to the third floor, we were on the second floor, were directly, as you walked up the stairs, our bathroom door opened up to 
anybody who happened to be walking up those stairs. And mom used to love to tell that story. We played in the snow and eventually I just learned to take buses to the Smithsonian Institute. And so I spent a good three weeks going several times a week, I think every day, to the Smithsonian. In the mornings on weekdays, it was often empty. I was the only one. And there were all those different buildings, nine different buildings. And that was an unforgettable experience to be able to Put a quarter on the bus at the bus stop and transferred it got me to the smithsonian and i went to each of those big buildings and just explored what a great experience for a 12 year old dad and mom meanwhile were set on going to nepal that is what dad was originally offered and uh, he was excited about going there but uh, sergeant shriver the director of the peace corps had other ideas for him because the uh, story has it that bob Poole, who had been peace corps director in malawi was now at that time africa director and so he met dad and got to know him and he wanted dad to go to malawi and he told shriver and apparently Shriver owed Bob Poole some kind of favor, as the, as the story is told, and so agreed to send Will Lauder to be a, a deputy director in Malawi. Well, Dad tried to talk Sergeant Shriver out of it. He was really set on going to Nepal. But the rest is history. It was a great uh, decision on the part of Shriver, and Bob Poole knew it was a great, was probably a better place for a family to be than Nepal. And uh, the rest, of course, is history. Mom and Dad took us to all the different places that you go in Washington, the, uh, the White House and the Senate, the, the Capitol, and the uh, oh, and most memorable for me was the, the new National Geographic building with some really great displays, brand new, it just opened. We uh, went and met a number of the Peace Corps people and the Peace Corps buildings kind of a blur to me I do remember going when we were in you know downtown washington doing these things we used to dad would take us to a uh, a place to eat called schultz's cafeteria and i guess it's kind of a legendary place but being 1964 it was an old style cafeteria um bob pool he uh later we went to uh uh when we did the safari up to Nairobi. We stayed at the Poole's house and Bob tragically died in an auto accident in Africa uh, some years later. His daughter Joyce uh, Poole is one of the top experts in, uh, on elephants and lives in Kenya and then Bobby Poole is a documentary documentary uh, filmmaker in, in, who specializes in Africa documentaries. So uh, anyway, off we went to uh, Africa. Let's see, we also got to know Samson Mbundula, who was dad's uh, Chinyanja teacher. And so later we did go to Samson's village, which was somewhere, as I recall, south, uh, it was uh, east and south of, um, of Blantyre, somewhere maybe uh, near Chileka, so uh, off we went with our blue nylon pennies jackets, uh, warm coats, arrived in London and got our hotel and listened to the funny accents of the, the porters and everything and, and we needed to go out and eat and it was 1 a.m. by the time we decided to go out and they said, well, the only thing open is this and that. So we got into a taxi and and went and went and it was it turned out to be a, a, a nightclub. I just have this memory of this large like uh, hall. It was I guess a pub, and we went in. These you know, obviously young American family with with you know, butch haircuts and blue nylon jackets. And I looked across the room, and all of the men in the whole looked like Beatles. They all had Beatles haircuts. This was December of 1964. And that was just a, a stark memory for me. Uh, and so we, um, they asked what is what we want to drink, and they, we said, well, do you have what do you have? And they said, uh, you know, do you have um, Seven Up? Well, we have lemonade, and um, of course that back then was uh, the equivalent of uh, Seven Up. So then off to uh, Africa, Nairobi, and then to Blantyre. When we 
got to Blantyre, the biggest city in Malawi, the old colonial city. The house that we were supposed to live in was not ready yet, and it was being, I guess, worked on. So we were put into a big and old colonial um, plantation house, really, from back in the old days, outside of Blantyre, called the Field Center. It was back then, in the, in the 60s, Peace Corps, Corps volunteers could come into town from all over the country and, uh, you know, they could do it once a month or something and once every few months make the trip and stay there. It was that the field centers were ended by the 1970s, but we uh, were put into this huge old um, plantation mansion, really. It was, you know, it just had a tin roof. But the great thing about it, the rooms were huge. They had these, uh, you know, the red um, cement floors. And the best thing was the huge porch that went around on three sides of the house that was a good 15 feet wide with the outer um, part being, the outer wall, so to speak, was about 18 inches or two feet high that you, you could sit on. Uh, and beyond that was a big yard and then um, essentially regrown forest from the times when it was probably growing tea or some kind of crops to the point that we could hear bush babies at night. And so we were introduced to that uh, call, that old African call, which has pretty much disappeared except for when I went up to the um, Hermitage in the hills of Dodoma. But um, so the field center came with a cook by the name of Saidi, who uh, was from a Muslim tribe of people known as the, uh, the, the Yao people. And the Yao were, they have kind of an infamous history of being the tribe that um, the Arab Muslim slave traders uh, allied with to capture and uh, capture African, you know, the people, local people all over Malawi, all over East Africa, or all over what was then Malawi, Nyasaland, um, for the slave trade. And uh, they were, um, they are, I think, the only Muslim tribe and had some kind of tradition of being what we knew then in 1965 as houseboys. And so Saidi, then when we later moved, two months, two and a half months later, moved to our house on the Mount Pleasant, uh, Saidi's brother, Mas Balakazi, became our cook and who was beloved to us. Both were very... Um, good men, good men. Uh, and so the thing about living at the field center for the first two and a half months is that all these volunteers came and we got to know them. And that was just kind of lucky because the house wasn't ready for us to go live, you know, isolated from the volunteers and from Africans. And so um, we got to know quite a few volunteers. I remember John, a guy named John who came every weekend from the miserable little town of Chikwawa down in the lowlands. Um, I guess it was a, about an hour and a half bus ride from Blantyre. I never made it to Chikwawa. There, the only, I've only heard stories of hot, humid misery and mosquitoes in Chikwawa. So this poor guy, John, just came every weekend. I, I used to know his last name. It was January when we got there, and that's the rainy season. That's right in the beginning of the rainy season, and I just remember it being sort of rainy and gray and overcast. And that's when I was taken to St. Andrew's uh, Prep School, is what they called it, to start uh, to enter into um, uh, Standard 7. Okay, so the British school system goes Standard 1 through 7, and... Standards one through six was an elementary school that 
Mike went to. Mike went to Standard 6 and suffered under Mr. Benton. And um, Mr. Benton was a bit of a an old British um, meanie. He used to thresh Mike's hand with the ruler and stuff like that. Um, I started school Standard 7 from Mrs. Rowe Roberts, who was the daughter of the headmaster. There was some nepotism going on there. Uh, and it wasn't easy. It was not an easy time for me. Dad would take me to school, take Mike to school, and I guess, or maybe Mom took Mike to school, but Dad would take me to school and drop me off, and I was depressed. Uh, well, it was it was a tough time, but you know that when you're 12 years old, you just do those things, do what you're told, and so we essentially had a situation that was sort of you could see recreated in the Harry Potter movies with the teachers and headmasters in 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 the hall with black robes, and we had assembly and. It was also new to me. It just um, was, uh, you know, I guess at that age, you just get through those things. St. Andrew's Preparatory School. Let's see. We had PT, physical training, from a Scotsman named Mr. Smith. He, um, he used to, like after we swam he would tell us okay get your clothes on get out and get to the next class and he would come in with a tacky a tacky was a british word for a athletic you know a, a workout shoe a ked as we would call them and he would whack us if we were going too slow mr smith was um he had his favorites peter keelan john pryor so i had um I had taken up pole vaulting in the backyard in Davis before we left. It must have been the spring and summer of 1964. And I set up, I got these bamboo, dad got me bamboo pole vault poles from that were left over from having coached track and a, uh, a crossbar that's used for high jumping and, and pole vaulting. And I set this thing up and I would... It must have been four feet high, four and a half. Maybe I got up to five feet. I put a little um, hole there for the pole to go into, just like on the tracks. And then when we had track and field as part of PT, um, I told Mr. Smith, oh, I've done this before. Can I go do it? And he said, no, Lotta. And he had Keelan and Pryor go over and, and you know, they'd never done it before. He, they were just his favorites. Then I remember one day we were playing rugby they, they, uh, for PT. They made teams. I can't remember how. And there was a guy in my class by the name of Dave Gorman. His, his father was the Shell. Um, uh, I think he was one of the Shell representatives of Shell Gas, gasoline. And um, Dave was strong and fast. He was, you know, my age, maybe a little older, but... He had a bit of a gap tooth. Nice, not a bad guy. He was a nice guy. And he was running the ball, and he was just used to running running through people because he was strong and fast. And I, he was coming towards me, and, you know, I took my football background at the age of 12, and having played, you know, just with the neighborhood kids out on Vern Hickey's putting green, um... And so I, he was heading right toward me, ready to just bowl me over and run past me like he was doing everybody else. And I put my head down, and I put my shoulder right into him as he ran. And I heard this oomph, and the ball went flying, and, and he was so surprised. And Mr. Smith said, nice. Well done, Lotta. <laughs> That's all of the rugby that I remember. And in 1966, a year after we had been there, mom and dad made it, did a trip to Ethiopia for, I don't know, nine, eight or nine days and put us into the, the boarding school for a week. 
And so we became boarders and that was a real, that was quite an experience um, to be in a British boarding school with all those traditions and the, the, um, well, the bullying. Although by that time, Mike and I were, we were holding our own. We didn't get bullied that bad, but I do remember the, um, I do remember being depressed and went and asked the nurse, told the nurse I had an upset stomach. She gave me some kind of, you know, um, white calcium, you know, sort of, I guess, magnesium, old fashioned stuff. And we ate, we had breakfast, lunch, and dinner in the mess hall in the, the cafe, I guess they called it the, um, I can't remember what they called it, but long wooden tables and um, knobby meadows and other prefix wandering around. There were, prefix were these selected individuals, I guess there must have been no more than eight or ten of them in the school, and they got to wear white shirts. And um, Nobby Meadows was one, Gavin Wills was another, and um, of course Nobby was infamous for being, um, you know, quite the British, quite the old-fashioned bully. The food was quite British, sardines on toast for breakfast, uh, baked beans on bread on toast at times for lunch. Nothing too exciting. I got caned probably seven or eight times in two years. I never told my dad he would have gone down there and and grabbed the headmaster by the collar and then taken us out of school. Uh, so, um, but by, by the time I got the first one, I had learned from other boys that it was more of a, of a challenge that brings you up in the eyes of the other boys. I did get what is known as three of the best twice that in which they send you to the headmaster, actually the, the vice headmaster, Mr. Snelson would give that, those canings. But again, you know, I would head back to class and then, you know, with a little bit of a smile to the other guys, the other boys. I mean, it, it hurt. And I did have a pair of shorts that had three broken, three stripes where the threads were broken. And I had it, it was, they were in the garage at home. I had gotten them and I got rid of them. I wish I had not done that. I wasn't traumatized by the canings. I had the only record player of all the students at the hostel. And so it was a little portable thing that, um, and so I remember they had a dance and brought the record player. And so I was a bit, you know, I got, I got by. All right. We brought the record player and our Beach Boys records. We had Beach Boys and Jan and Dean LPs. And we had a couple of Beatles records at that point. And I remember they, they played some of the Stones records and we danced. I, I just remember dancing with my hands in my pockets. I don't remember who I danced with. Although I did um, this Canadian girl named Anne Reynolds. Uh, she and I liked each other and we would sit at break time at 10 in the morning school started pretty early we would go at um 7 30 and 7 20 in the morning um and we would sit and there was a little cubby hole where inside they would sell cokes for sixpence and so i would you know i would buy a coke and ann and i would sit on the wooden bench and everybody said oh don lotter and lotta and ann reynolds are hitched The money was, of course, still British, the old British uh, pounds, shillings, and pence, and all those nicknames they have for their the money. The um, the they didn't have halfpennies, half pennies anymore, but the the pennies had, a, had were made so that they had a hole in the middle so that the Africans could put them on a, str a string and carry them around and pennies were one of their main currencies 
And then the next up was the Tiki, which is a threepence. And the next up was six pence or, or a bob. Uh, no, excuse me, a half bob. And then the shilling, which was a bob. And after that, there was a florin, which was a two shilling coin. And then there was the two, two and six, okay, which was the half crown. Uh, the two shillings and sixpence, two and six. But then they didn't have, I, I don't remember ever seeing a, a five shilling coin. It went up to um, to the the uh, two and six. And then the paper money started at ten, uh, 10 bob. And of course, a pound was 20 bob. And then there, uh, the guinea. The guinea was always and historically 21 shillings, a pound, one pound and one shilling. And whenever they had any kind of entertaining entertainment where you would pay for something, you know, to say a, a, a evening event, you'd pay, they would charge a guinea. And that one extra shilling went to the house or something. It was just an old British tradition. And speaking of Coca-Cola, I... Um, when Mike and I made the trip up to Karanga, which I will relate, I remember coming back from a bicycle, the bicycle ride where we were both just um, dying of thirst. And uh, we went to a little store and there was, uh, there's no electricity in town. And there was this refrigerator. The only refrigerator in town was the Coca-Cola gas fired, um, I guess, um, uh, not propane, but um, a kerosene refrigerator, and there were Cokes and Fantas in there, and then in one corner were the, the doctor's medicines the, uh, that had to be refrigerated. That was uh, the inroads of technology Coca-Cola. We had sports houses, Livingston, Laws, Johnston, and Sharp. Actually, I think they did away with Sharp. We had um, Livingston Laws and Johnston were the, uh, and then each of those, the, the school, the students were all divided into uh, those three and competed against each other. As I recall, I was in uh, Johnston, as in Fort Johnston, which um, was historically British, one of the British. Uh, uh, you know, colonizers. Mike and I uh, rode our bikes to school. It was a long ride. It was a good 15 minutes, 20 minute uh, hilly ride um, from Mount Pleasant, then uh, to get to school down Mandala Hill, and then up from the clock tower to um, St. Andrews. And we were the only ones. We would arrive all sweaty and there would be maybe three or four bicycles there. Everybody else got rides. Uh, I remember, um, you know, Dave Gorman and his father would drop him off every day, and Danny Judd would arrive with his brother, um, his two brothers. Uh, the oldest one could drive at the age of 15 or 16. And then riding back home, we had to uh, get up Mandala Hill, which is pretty it was a pretty good hill I used to occasionally race the uh, the Africans and um, I did pretty well there was only one time where a guy caught up with me and and passed me going to Sochi taking that left turn going to Sochi hill I remember how I had a crush on the on the um, a Norwegian girl whose father was one of the was the ambassador from Norway don't know her name, never got to know her because we left. But um, the other American kids, there might, there were maybe a dozen American kids in the school. Um, some of them had been there a long time, almost all of them missionaries. And so we had some social things. I remember a girl named Lee, her last name. Anyway, I, I kind of liked her. But, um, you know, in those days, at the age of 13, 12, 13, you don't, um, you know, you, you don't do much. 
Yes, Lee Hagen was her name. Again, parents were missionaries. Other people, other families we knew, American, were the Coxes, lived up the hill. Lois Cox was an, uh, a painter. Very, mom enjoyed time with her. Then um, the Wrights, um, Mervyn Wright was uh, a prefect, one of the, uh, I guess, probably the only American prefect. Uh, and then, of course, there were the Judds and a number of others. Um, some of them were boarders because their uh, dads were uh, stationed out up country. One of the legendary figures at St. Andrew's Prep School was Mrs. Mullen, the history teacher. She had a classroom out on a, it was kind of a peninsula. It was like a, it was on the second floor of a, of a building that had a wing that just went out and she was at the very end with windows on three sides. And when you walked out there, it was her land, okay? It was her territory, her planet. And even the, the tough guys like Nobby Meadows, Peter Keelan, Peter Steele, Banyan were, you know, kowtowed to Mrs. Mullen. They were terif Everyone was terrified of her. She taught um, English history, and I won't soon forget the uh, being in there and that, that first that first couple of months. You know, it was cloudy and rainy, and and um, learning about the uh, peasant, you know, the manner and the demean. Uh, and she would, um, boy, if you didn't do your homework, uh, she would uh, send you to get. Uh, first, she would she would take a bit of your hair right next to your ear and pull it right in front of your ear, sort of where a sideburn would be, and she would pull that. She would say, "Lotta, why didn't you do your homework?" And you know. Um, Okay, I'll do it, you know, and, <laughs> and your penmanship had to be good, and um, yeah, so that was Mrs. Mullen. However, as I learned from the, the British culture, the sports club, I learned something else about Mrs. Mullen. The center of the British colonial life was the sports club which was more, it was, it had bar, restaurant, all the playing fields that they used to, well, big field where they play cricket, rugby, soccer in that order of, of uh, priority, and then tennis courts, clay tennis courts made from the particular sandy red uh, soil particles from ant hills. Every particle had been carried by an ancient ant, and so it was all. They were all about the same size. And so Dad decided, okay, this is 1965. It's um, still a segregated British colonial um, social sports club of whites only and so he said okay since we're such a sports oriented family he said, okay we'll join and then we'll get the first we'll work on getting a african there which he eventually did with malua who later became the five-time tennis champion of malawi so we went every weekend to the Blantyre Sports Club just as we went to the university tennis courts in Davis. But we went every every weekend, but also went to play on a number of weekdays, play tennis. And during the hot season uh, in, well, I guess that was February, March, April. I guess it was you know, basically October through um, March and April, the swimming pool was open. 
little, you know, not about the big a, size of a of a backyard pool of our backyard pool in Davis. And so I, I played in the junior tournaments, and I remember afterwards they the Brits were quite. Um, they had these rituals, these old rituals. They gave me what they called a rock shanty, which was um, ginger ale and bitters, I guess, which was what they gave um, their uh, youngsters. The um, the bar was a typical British pub bar, and I remember Dad taking Malua there the first time and getting some comments about what what is that boy doing here. It was still old British um, colonial society. A couple of my teachers played tennis there, Mr. Lettington, big red-faced and kind Mr. Lettington, and then Mrs. Mullen, the history teacher, otherwise known as Flory Mullen. And it was like some kind of Mr. Hyde. Come on, Coco. Come on. Come on up. She... She was just, she was totally different. Hello, Don, how are you? And um, in the social situation, I was pretty surprised because that classroom of hers is, a, is like a prison. Everybody quiet. So early on in, the, in Dad's tenure there, they came up with a, an American rugby team. I don't know who, I mean, my dad would have been part of it, but I, I don't think he initiated that. But anyway, they got rugby jerseys, red, white, and blue rugby jerseys. And then we went to these different sports clubs around southern Malawi, you know, Cholo, Malanji, Lulongwe, Zamba, and got roundly defeated by the, the Brits because, you know, Americans don't know how to, didn't know how to play rugby back then. But we still got a taste of that whole thing. It was all in good fun. They um, would always have a good uh, social event afterwards. The PCVs taught us a lot. I remember, well, Mom's famous uh, Sunday morning pancake breakfast. We had as many as, gosh, I think 40 might have turned up one time. It was probably the weekend when there was some kind of um, volunteer PCV um, uh, meetings or something. But I remember they used to play records on our record player and they'd bring over... Actually, Mike McCone gave us the first, our first Bob Dylan album, Mike 1965, and I remember playing it and just... Uh, who is this guy with a funny voice? But the volunteers played um, played that record, talked about it. They also taught us about the Vietnam War. They uh, actually had a newsletter in which they were um, saying negative things about the Vietnam War, and the, the American ambassador was um, he was against that, and Dad. So I recall Dad and Mike McCone. Mike was director then. Um, simply turned him down or ignored him, but Mike eventually got um, transferred out, I think at the behest of the, the rather conservative um, ambassador. It was at the field center that first two months at that huge uh, former colonial plantation house and I think that was where I'm pretty sure that's where mom started the, the pancake breakfast which carried on at our house next to President Kamuzu Banda's house up there on Mount Pleasant it wasn't um, it was all of the houses were just modest sort of typical middle-class houses uh, although in in the colonial days they built each one differently our favorite vacations were go to, to go to the lake, to Cape McClear was our favorite. Salima was the one that was close, closest, just an hour from Lilongwe, or 45 minutes. 
and that's where they had uh, Peace Corps gatherings and meetings. Cape McClear was our vacation spot, and we would take the Peace Corps pickup up there and um, enjoy the uh, swimming, always during the dry season, because during the rainy season, the creeks would flow into the lake with Bill Hartsia, which was the otherwise known as schistosomiasis that uh, enters the body through the skin and survives in water that needs to have snails, a certain type of snail, as an intermediate host between humans, from human to human. Lake Nyasa is the f southernmost rift lake, part of the Rift Valley geological complex, and is a very deep lake with its, um, with its own currents and famous stories about storms that would um, take down boats, has its own interesting ecology with the one of the greatest speciations of fish in the world, the cichlids, famous uh, fish which would were valued for tropical fish collectors. Another thing that of the lake was the you would see these clouds, black clouds, like smoke rising from the lake, and they were these um, gnat, it's like a gnat, and I'm forgetting the, the exact name, but they were aquatic, and then they would go into this uh, life cycle where they would uh, fly up out of the water in such thick clouds that it was, there were stories of people um, suffocating in those clouds. The Africans would go out with big nets and capture them and eat them. They would, they would um, cook them and eat them. And then, of course, there was the Ilala, the ship that plied up and down the lake that I will talk more about in another segment. Dad had Peace Corps meetings up in Nairobi. And so Mom and Dad decided that we'll, we would all drive up through Tanzania so we could go see the famous game parks up there. Dad bought a Willys Jeep that uh, a 17 year old foster boy had uh, fixed. And so mom had made jerky from beef cuts she had bought at the open market in Limby, where a certain section of that market had butchers stalls. Mom always joked that she had to learn how to point to the different cuts of meat to let them know what she wanted. She also was knitting and it, we still, or we had for years, a it was a powder blue sweater that mom had that had, you know, 20 rows of the knitting with the red clay color of the dust of the road in Tanzania. We drove up through Malawi, past um, Karanga, which was just a little history here, where the British had fought the Arab Swahili slave traders and defeated them. The uh, when Livingston first came to, in his legendary walk across, across Africa from Angola, from the West Coast, he was uh, just devastated by the devastation okay, that, that the Arab Swahili slave trade was uh, causing to the, all of the, the different tribes except the most warlike ones, like the Angonis, 
uh, were just being decimated by the, the slave trade from the coast, from the east coast. And they, where they would, um, and, and so I, I talked about uh, Mas, Balakazi, and Saidi, uh, the, our cook. Our, uh, Saidi was our first cook, and then he, his relative, um, Mas, became our permanent cook. And um, they were of the Yao tribe, which is a southern Malawi tribe, uh, Muslim. And they were the ones who were the main uh, slave um, cap capturers. And so um, Livingston went back to Britain and you know, made speeches and said, we, we must go in there and stop that slave trade. And so I showed the, the book by Johnston and he details how they came into that part of, of Malawi, Johnston and uh, was it Maples? Anyway, they had some uh, a small military uh, outfit, and they went to the different uh, tribes, and there were dozens of them in East Africa, and asked them if they would like protection from the slave traders. And one by one, they all said yes. They all agreed. And so it was up in Karanga that they actually fought these slave traders lost some British lives. They had uh, trained, um, they had done the first uh, training of what later became known as King's African Rifles, the colonial African um, uh, you know, military for the British who actually went later to boat into World War I and World War II, uh, fought for the British. And so it's just a bit of history that not all of the colonialism was uh, initially just complete exploitation. Uh, they um, they brought in the they brought in missionaries. The Church of Scotland, since uh, David Livingston was Scottish, and and from Church of Scotland, they the Church of Scotland is, is quite strong in Malawi, uh, as well as Church of England, and then the in the Catholic Church, all came in and. And then the rest of colonial history, of course, is, is well known. But um, th that's just something that I think not a lot of people know, just a little history of that area. So up we drove north uh, through Tanzania. We uh, drove through, I don't, <laughs> none of us remember Dodoma. We remember Mbeya and Iringa in southern Tanzania, but not Dodoma. And we, we probably stayed overnight there possibly even in the Dodoma Hotel, which I later was, you know, would, would go to at least once a week for my Guinness and uh, a meal. And then as we drove north, we, we got to um, Arusha, and I think we went straight to Serengeti, and to the Ngorongoro crater, the uh, famous parks, uh, game parks there in Tanzania, which are still the best. Back then, we were a lot freer than in than it is now. We could camp in you know where in in the parks and stuff. And so, coming down, Ngorongoro is a, is a is a a huge crater about I think twenty miles across filled with game and many of our pictures are there they're all all of the game are there the uh, lions elephants and the uh you name it we a number of our pictures are from there and then as we drove up the steep escarpment to get to go to leave i remember it was very steep dirt you know rocky road and dad would have to stop and put the the darn willies into first gear and as he did so we would we would lurch and, and move backwards to towards you know a, a cliff practically um and <laughs> i would just close our eyes that's also where we um had something happen that you know will never happen again and that's being charged by rhinoceros 
they are all um, now guarded by um, game wardens. Each each rhino has, or I, I'm not sure exactly how, but anyway, they the uh, our guide who took us around uh, in the jeep um, rode with us. So no, don't move, don't move. When when this rhino was charging at us, and so we have the picture. <laughs> Dad took a picture of just the rear end of this rhino um, after it had stopped a foot from the car with us screaming and lying down on the floor of the car. And so we visited uh, these great game parks pretty much on our, you know, by ourselves. It was not the tourist season. We also um, went to Aldvai Gorge, which to me was very significant now. It was completely abandoned, it was completely empty. It was the rainy season, and so the Leakies, who had just discovered the uh, Zinjanthropus, man, the hominid, um, Australopithecine uh, hominid, I believe it is what it was, and um, we, and had, they had been there just a few months before, but there was no one there during the rainy season, not even. I mean, this was 1966, so we wandered around and looked at the digs. The volcano, you know, the crater, Ngorongoro Crater. We went down the steep, you know, it was it was pretty steep, windy down. Got down to the flat, and and then we're, um, we were driving somewhere uh, towards Arusha. It was, it was just out in the bush, and bam, the jeep lurched off to the left and we kind of crashed into a culvert and the the leaf spring had broken on the jeep and we had just come off of a steep escarpment and so long story short we got out dad um we were all i guess standing around the car and dad was out on the road and a land rover drove up and it was uh, all described in Mom's book, um, to Africa with Spatula. It was the the uh, the hunter guide Steve Smith and two elderly Americans, and they stopped and opened the window and what can we do you for, honey? They, you know, Southern. They were they were from Virginia, I think, and they they took us to their camp, a safari camp where Steve had said he'd taken the um the crew and actors of the um he had worked on born free and on um told us stories about that movie and about uh hatari the one with john wayne and so we um we stayed and night their dad went off with um dad waited there with the car and a truck came along, picked him up, to towed, I believe they towed the willies to a workshop near Arusha uh, and, you know, fixed, fixed it, did the work for some nominal fee. Dad was so thankful. And, and we connected then with, um, with Dad again in Arusha and so Arusha was um, later where I went in almost 50 years later uh, to um, to volunteer for a food, water, shelter. But Mike and I uh, discovered the uh, a little ice cream store that, sh that sold milkshakes, chocolate milkshakes. And it was two Indian brothers there on the main uh, drag of Arusha. And... So we, you know, that was a big deal for us. And so 50, almost 50 years later, I'm in Arusha. And I, you know, most of the, the, uh, the good, most of the shops that have stuff that you, that you want are, are Indian, uh, Indian shops. These, uh, the Indian population of East Africa were uh, known as Banyans. And the Banyans apparently are a, a sort of a caste in India who are merchants 
And so the, uh, the British routinely called the Indian Spaniards. And so it was, you know, Arusha still had um, dozens of these Indian stores. And I would say, you know, when I would be talking with them in the shop, you know, I, I was near here in, in the mid-60s and went to a shop that had sold ice cream. Oh, that guy still has a shop down by ShopRite, which was the South African chain um, grocery store in Arusha. And they had a complex, they had a, had, you know, a little kind of a, a mall with um, uh, 30 or 40 smaller shops. And they said, yeah, he's down at the bottom. And so I went there and there's this ice cream store. It wasn't in the same, of course, it wasn't the same location, but, and I, I went in and I talked, I said, you know, well, I went, my brother in 1966 and we, we, uh, we had milkshakes. And he said, yes, that was my brother and I, my family had a dairy. Uh, outside of Arusha and they with that milk they made um, they sold milk and ice cream and, and all those things and so that was fun <laughs> he's you know I think I was I don't think he has had many customers but because it was in this sort of a corner of the shop right uh, mall that so anyway up we went to Nairobi we uh, went to Amboseli uh, National Park and stayed with the pool Bob pool family there in Nairobi mom and then dad went to his meetings whatever the the Peace Corps meetings were and um, we we sort of just um, probably <laughs> invaded the pool's house all six of us then later um, we we f dad arranged to have the the Jeep the Willie's Jeep uh, driven back by a I guess a Peace Corps volunteer and we flew then from Nairobi to Dar es Salaam. Spent a couple of days in Dar es Salaam. That's where Mike, when we went to the beach at Dar, in Dar, Mike stepped on a sea urchin. And so again, this is all detailed in mom's book because we um, got back to the hotel. Mike was in pain and all these spines in his, the bottom of his, of his foot. And, and um, they, they said, okay, well, you know, here's a doctor. They called the doctor and it was a, a British guy, British, you know, who'd been there all his life, I guess, and and he uh, he said, okay, here here's what we do: we put ripe papaya, get a ripe papaya, and and then and then ba you know bandage it to the bottom of your foot. Of course, papaya has you know the enzymes and stuff. I guess that's just a so anyway. We mom, you know, she laughed about that. Mike just a, a couple of weeks ago in Hawaii stepped on a a sea urchin in in um, Maui, and, and I said, you know, go go get a ripe papaya and put it on the bottom of your foot. So that was our trip to, that was our safari up through Tanzania and when flying back, we flew back to Malawi. By mid-1965, I had adjusted pretty well to St. Andrews and the, the whole system of um, the British Danny Judd, who was the son of a um, Georgia Southern Baptist, well, Church of Christ, we call it, we can call it Southern Baptist, uh, missionary. The Judds had f five kids, three boys, and two girls, Dan, right in the middle. And so Dan became my friend. He, he um, the British system, the school system was kind of old-fashioned. They, they kind of look at you and, and maybe, you know, they, they'd say, okay, you're going to go into the... They had the A classes and the B classes uh, each, each year. And the Bs were the less um, academically, uh, I guess, difficult where... And then the As were the, what, the more, you know... Um, and so they put me in A and Dan was in B. Because he had a probably because he had a southern accent or something, um, and Dan has um, we've stayed in touch for fifty five years now. Um, Dan has gone through a lot. He now, uh, you know, being from a very uh, you know conservative old South, you know, Georgia, they have that that's that drawl. And uh, Dan is now married, has a husband, 
lives in Bulgaria most of the time and um, went through, you know, a couple of decades of difficult time with, with his family, I think, on that, on, you know, all of, all of um, his personal life and stuff. But they, he's, he's, you know, he's such a sweet guy that they couldn't, his family, I think, just finally had to realize um, that he's, he's just not going to change. He's, he's gay. And that they, they tried for um, years to convert. And Dan, if you're listening to this, I hope this is all right. I actually bring this into my um, biology course um, and tell tell them when I when I look at you know when I deal with gender and and sexuality and um, that uh, a person's inner self it just is not going to change. You can't legislate it. You can't do it with prayer and and exorcism or whatever. Okay. So anyway, um, we have we have stayed friends. Um, even though Dan is um, sort of uh, politically um, with his brethren there in the um, white part of the South, Georgia, um, we're still friends. Um, so Mike and I made our trip. This is when we started to travel um, on our own. It was when um, a Peace Corps volunteer by the name of Tom Pop up, way up in the north of the country in Karanga, which we had driven by. Um, we actually don't drive, drive through Karanga to go to Tanzania, but uh, he said, why don't you guys come up and visit? You, know, you can take the Alala, the boat, the ship that goes up and down the, the lake. And so Mike and I, Mom, said, yeah, okay. And she loaded up a suitcase with gifts and stuff for Tom and, and Tom Pop and Rich, uh, his uh, housemate up there in Karanga, his, uh, another volu- Peace Corps volunteer. And so we got on the train there in Blantyre, which was a steam locomotive train, and took it up to um, Monkey Bay, which was where the Alala, um, its southern port, and got on and got our our room uh, and had a great three-day cruise up there. Two Peace Corps volunteers were along, just happened to be going back, um, Fritz and Emily Sparks, and so mom was happy about that. And um, so we, we, um, we dined with the captain and first mate and, and I could read, I took my books. At that time I was reading about the Bataan Death March. I was reading all these books about World War II. Then Tom met us at, um, at the, the little port south of um, Karanga Chilumba, I think it is, it's called Anne. And then he said, you know, he, he said, we have to, um, we have to walk across the river because at that time there was, there were political, there were political uprisings in Malawi against Dr. Banda, who actually was our, our neighbor and who was becoming, you know, a dictator, I guess. And, um, and so the North had always been, um, kind of neglected. They, they, um, had a tradition up in the north of, of Church of Scotland, missionaries educating them quite well. And they also were missing the big plantation system of the south where the British imposed a hut tax in the south that forced the, the men the, the men and women to uh, go to work, especially the men in the tea plantations, tobacco plantations. And so in the south there was much more animosity um, from the Africans towards the, the British, but the North, they didn't have that. And so the the Church of Scotland um, was up there and they, they had good schools and they became just still are uh, well-educated and peaceful, very friendly people up there in the North. They speak Timbuka. And so um, there were some problems and the, the Malawi, um, the young pioneers were the sort of, a, a sort of a, a um, a force, a uniformed force that uh, that were Dr. Banda's, Kamuzu Banda's force around, and they had they had uh, blocked a bridge across the river, and so we had to walk, we had to cross. It was only about probably forty feet across, and not deep at all. It was the dry season, but we we hesitated, 
And and Tom said, hey, "Come on, you guys." And, she, and we we just we wouldn't go in. And said, "He said, what's 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 going on?" He said, "We had we had been trained to not touch any water because of Bill Hartsia. Bill Hartsia tended to um, be uh, you know the, these um, I guess they were they were nematodes or worms that would attach to your skin and then um, get into your bloodstream, go to your liver, cause the other name is schistosomiasis. They were schistosomes. And so, he, and he said, oh man, you guys are so well trained. Yeah, come on. We don't, you know, I don't think it's a problem. And, and so he laughed about that the whole week. Um, and we got to his little house in Karanga and opened up that, that suitcase. And each day we took out something for, for Tom and Rich. For instance, the, um, a canned ham and then Mom had put in little boxes of uh, Tom Tom cigarettes. I don't know. I guess um, she didn't know that we went in the backyard and we we would buy cigarettes and go into the backyard and of of uh, and blind tire and smoke. Um, and I guess they were for you know whoever the uh, African you know cook and stuff. And Tom was just he was like, oh no, what what have you got now? You know, chocolate and candy and all sorts of things. Then Rich, I remember Rich read when when we took our bike ride. Tom took us on a bike ride to to the to see to see if we could f see the hippo that was that would come to a village. And we rode, I guess, ten miles north, uh, eh, probably only five. And it was a hot day, and went to this village. And the hippo wasn't there, but we were both we were all thirsty. We didn't take water with us. And I guess it wasn't that far, but two boys, you know, 13 and 12, were pretty thirsty. And and this woman um, goes and scoops a cup of water, two cups of water out of the lake, and brings it to us. And Mike drank the whole thing. He was really thirsty. I didn't. I refused. You know, I just would not. You just don't drink water. Um, although the lake is known to be clean with its currents and stuff. And um, so then when we got back, that's when we went and got Cokes where, you know, where that uh, Coca-Cola refrigerator was with the doctor's medicines. So that was our trip. And then it was 50 years later in 2016, I um, took, no, it was 2015. I, I went when I was living in Dodoma and I had this uh, spine um, problem. I, I um, was you know, only partially, and just like I am now, but not not quite as um, I was still deteriorating. I had I had had surgery and come back to um, Dodoma to teach, and I I uh, took the buses down and took the Alala. Fifty years later, took the Alala down down the lake. Um, to I really wanted to do that. I would be remiss if I did not talk about music when talking about Africa. It's kind of like the water the fish swim in uh, for the Africans. The first two are uh, come from the influence of South Africa. The first is the music that was played in every colonial, British colonial situation, the cinemas, the uh, restaurants, the sports clubs, all of those places. The second is the uh, African music that came with the miners who went down to the gold mines in South Africa and came back. Uh, this was uh, Joburg, in other words, uh, Johannesburg-based music. You can hear the influence in, uh, of the second one of the African music in the first one, the Burt Kempfert swinging safari. Then the third is uh, the choir uh, women singing uh, on the seashore of the lake, uh, Lake Nyasa, is very traditional music in uh, Africa.
And finally, the music of the Congo. This, these were the music that we heard there at that time in the 60s. <laughs> Some of the memories I have are of uh, going with mom to the Ngaludi Mission Orphanage during our um, vacations from school and taking, you know, taking care of the babies there. Also um, playing tennis. The um, I played in the junior tournaments. Sandro Agostini, who was a couple of years older than me, uh, asked me to be his doubles partner and we played, I think we won the uh, 16 and under um, doubles and you know, spent lots of time at the uh, Blantyre Sports Club. And then downtown Blantyre we would go to the Candodo supermarket as well as there was a, a market called the Co-op down the hill and we would go to Dairy Den, which had ice cream. Another ritual was to go with the Judds. We would walk uh, the dogs to the dip, which was a dip to kill fleas and ticks. And uh, the, the Judds had these huge dogs. I would go visit them. And these dogs would run down the driveway towards me and um, Dan would just say oh lift up their ear and blow in it uh, you know with this this great Dane and a Doberman pincer running towards me um, so <laughs> and I would have dinners with them they would make uh, when they were gonna have curry their curry dinner there was a curry a certain curry that was actually had a favorite curry um, and, and so that was pretty much the, the remaining time that we had. Uh, we were, we were well adjusted there and soon it was time to go home. We had gotten to know the, a number of the Peace Corps volunteers pretty well and, um, you know, went to the lake with them, had them over for various, you know, for the Sunday pancake breakfasts. One of Dad's volunteers was Paul Thoreau, the author. He got into trouble because he um, apparently um, drove the mother of the rebel leader, Chippenberry, uh, out of the country just after, I guess, Chippenberry had... We, the, the, um, they attempted to overthrow uh, Kamuzabanda just after we got there. I think it was um, January of, it was the same month that we got there. And the story goes that um, they needed to get to, um, across the Shiri River to get to Zamba. I think Zamba was the capital. And it was, they, they were going on Saturday night because they knew they, that the soldiers of the King's African Rifles who 
Camus Zubanda had, you know, kept them as he did many of the, you know, British actually. That's why Malawi was actually economically quite uh, well off for 10 to 15 years after independence, um, completely uh, as opposed to Tanzania and other places that, that booted the British out and then just took a, a huge dive um, economically. But uh, anyway, the King's African Rifles were were had, were you know drunk and partying and and but the ferry boat, the ferry uh, well not a boat <laughs> a raft that gets pulled across by by rope uh, was also drunk and they couldn't wake him from the other side, and they failed to get across uh, and were exposed and the um, the coup failed. So anyway, um, Thoreau then wrote, has written several books that relate his experiences in um, Malawi. In, in a, he was south of Blantyre in the southern part of Malawi near um, the old uh, Port Herald, the, the southern port on the, the, uh, on the Zambezi actually, somewhere near there. And dad always said he was one of the better volunteers. He was a good teacher. Um, Thoreau appeared to immerse himself in the culture where he was. He wasn't in an easy area. That was in the lowlands near Nsanji, near Zambezi River. It was malarial. But I never saw him socializing with the other volunteers. I think he stayed in his site. But the, the Peace Corps uh, staff appreciated that kind of immersion uh, with volunteers. More recently, I believe he's change his name to Theroux, but if you want to pronounce it the French way and not the way he grew up, he should be saying Theroux. He's written fiction um, in which Dad, um, a, a part of Dad's character was in there along with Wes Leach, he, you know, how authors in fiction, they'll, they'll do a composite and, and I think that was the one in My Secret Life, Dad was in, in there as a... Um, you know, a, a jock, basically. And, um, and then uh, Thoreau also, in his, uh, I think it's called Dark, Dark Star Safari, he goes back to Sochi College, where he, he had, um, I think after the Peace Corps, he had taught there for a while, which is just uh, outside of Blantyre. And he's just, so disappointed by how run down it has become uh, in, I think it that was in the 19, I guess it was in the 1990s, he went, it was 30, 30 years later, 35 years later, and, and I know exactly what he was experiencing because, you know, I've, I've been back to those places and I taught, um, you know, at a university in, in Tanzania that these places get... Um, neglected and they just d didn't keep the up the um, you know the library would fall apart and you know the books would be you know, all stolen and the classrooms and the buildings all run down so um, Thoreau then went to teach at Makerere University in Kampala and Makerere actually has in Uganda uh, has really maintained itself as um, what I think is the top university in um, in East Africa. I'm not sure how, you know, about the Ethiopian ones, but I know that they, um, their scientists uh, actually do research and publish and, and, you know, the Tanzanians just don't have the, the, the incentives to do that. I will talk about Thoreau and his books uh, on Africa in uh, subsequent chapters.